A ride, a ride, a ride. Dead Man's Tone Podcast. Your host, Mr. Dead Man. Co-host, Becky. How's it going, Becky? Hey! Hey. Fine, how are you? I'm doing a ride, I'm doing a ride. And uh, tonight we have Patrick James Ryan. How's it going? I am doing great. Good evening, Jesse and Becky. Hey, no problem. Hey! Hey! I'm glad to hear you're doing all right, and I'm also glad that once again I said someone's name right. Ooh, that's man. exactly what I was gonna say. You <sighs> didn't slaughter his last name. I know. How am I supposed to mess up Ryan? How am I supposed to mess it up? But I don't know. But if it's possible, you could do it. Uh, 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 uh Ryan. There we go. Patrick James <laughs> uh, Ryan. You like that? Love it. No. <laughs> you don't like that version? No. That's your name now. Patrick James no. Arion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How yeah. do you feel about being a little cage in there? <laughs> Got a little twist to it, a little twang to it. That doesn't bother me a bit. Mm-hmm. Oh, which, by the way, to make sure the show goes without a hitch, I need to pray to baby Jesus. Oh, baby. God. Baby uh, Allah. Baby Cthulhu, baby, uh, just baby Buddha, and also baby Nicholas Passion. Nicholas Passion. I was going to say, yeah, just, don't forget that one. Mike. Yeah, he, he's God. the main one. If I don't pray to him, he's going to crash the show. Do, do you know who he is, Patrick? I have heard that name, and I've seen his name come up several times on Facebook, and it always seems to be mired in controversy. I don't know him and haven't uh, yeah. uh, met him, but it seems like uh, you, there's, you there's some going back you and don't forth wanna. with that and others. Yeah, you want to stay far away you, from you him. You don't want to. He, uh, yeah, I kind of gathered that based on some stuff I read. Yeah, he has a Encyclopedia Dramatica page. That's all you really need to know. <laughs> I mean, you have to really piss okay. off some people. I uh, mean, some a lot of people to get that. I mean, people earn that for being douchebags and assholes, you know. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, but on that page it says if you talk about him in a mean way, he can crash your show. He has like uber hacking skills. He he can send a bomb over the internet. <laughs> I talked bad about him once. Oh. <laughs> so ever since then, I have to pray to him in his baby form because I like. I like, I like baby form deities. Okay, that's my thing. Um, they're just so innocent and, and, you know, vulnerable. I like that. Um, with trust. <clears throat> anyway, anyway, uh, we got some stuff to talk about. First off, hey, I know? got I got something that's good. Oh yeah, what, what's what's going on over there? Well, you know, there's this. There's some towns that are um, fan and trick or treating, and if the kids are over a certain age, they're gonna go to jail. What? Are you serious? I kid you not. I'm not joking. No way. Chesapeake, Virginia. Chesapeake, Virginia. Anyone over the age of 13 who has caught trick or treating can be sent to jail for six months and fined. No, this has to be a prank. Right? Newport. Uh-uh. No, uh-uh. Newport, Newport News, Virginia. Kids can trick-or-treat until 7th grade or in, until they turn 12. After that, it's a misdemeanor. Several North Carolina cities have s- similar legal restrictions for 12- or 13-year-olds, as well as 9 p.m. curfews for all. That is in complete bullshit. In parts of bullshit. South Jersey... Oh, man. Oh, this gets better. The oh, yeah? parts of South Jersey, the curfew is at 7 with kids in Upper Deerfield Township also being told that 12 is the official cutoff. Wait, wait, wait. Go back. Did you say 7 was the curfew? Mm Mm-hmm. So 7 p.m. 7 p.m. They can't be out past 7 p.m. What the fuck is this? It's Halloween, motherfuckers. It's Halloween. Patrick, are you with me on this? It's Halloween. Come on. Um. And just when you think that the level of stupidity can't reach a deeper realm, we hear something like that. Unbelievable. I mean, yeah. This is on ABC 13 Eyewitness News. Who's, who are so the politicians? Whatever councilman passed that, that needs to find a life. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. And think about that. They're using your taxpayer money, ladies and gentlemen, of that of those towns, of the shithole towns that we were just talked about, to, to enforce this. There's other people like, I don't know, dealing drugs, uh, I don't know, busting cars and houses, egging cars, egging houses, um, smuggling kids, stabbing kids. We read all about that on the other other episodes. Go after them. Go after them. Oh, man. Right. I agree. You know what? You know what? So you can't go trick-or-treating, Jesse. Bullshit. They're going to have to stop me. They're going to stop me. I'm going to double down if I live in one of those Oh, God. Towns. We need bail money. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Yeah. I'll you know what? How can, they, how can they enforce it? There's no way. Yeah, and when they hold me up, I'd be like, what the fuck is wrong? I thought this is America. I thought it was a free country. What's going on, bro? I thought it was a free country, huh? I thought it was a free country. Huh? Free speech. Free free speech. <laughs> you better use your one phone call and call me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You call home and your wife may kick your ass. <laughs> Man, maybe. But it should be kick my ass for How another reason. They got half their police squad out of arresting 13-year-olds and a bank gets robbed. That would be pretty embarrassing. <laughs> oh, my God. You're not kidding. But how funny would that be? Yeah, they got that, a major... That serve them. Actually, it would serve them right. You know, I mean, really. I mean, it would. Yeah. They have a major robbery. What are they going to do mean, about it? What are, what are they hurting letting them trick-or-treat? I mean, I agree that... At some point in time, they are too old to go trick or treating. But I mean, I don't know. Well, just, I, I just, just let it, just let it play out naturally. If they're too old to trick or treat, then what happens is when people in high school talk about it, they get laughed at. Be like, dude, you still trick or treat, dude? That's lame. Why don't you just go to this party instead? Boom, problem solved. Right. You know, it's like, what's the big deal? So you want to make a law about it and enforce it? Man, that's just that, that that's man, that's a small time government getting interfering with people's lives. Where's where's the freedom, huh? Where's the freedom? Man. That's messed up. That's messed up. how could you call this a free country when you can't even go trick or treating? You can't even trick or treat past seven o'clock without the fear of being arrested. What is this communist China over here? What the fuck, man? What's going on? And going to jail for six months. Can you imagine a 13-year-old in jail for six months? I, I mean, hello? There's no way. Hello, this is there's no way. Yeah, I'm, I'm with Patrick. I don't think... I, I think there's a bunch of hogwash. I think it's a bunch of uh, posturing. It's on ABC 13 News on their website. It's that, not... I that, mean, that, it's that, not that, bull. That, oh, no, 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 no. I'm saying they could say what they want. They like like these towns. People oh, are, they, they could say what they want, but when it goes before a judge, and the judge has to hear the case, be like, "So why was he arrested?" Well, you see, Your Honor, he was out past curfew he, at seven p.m. Trick or treating. <laughs> be like, what the, what the fuck? What is this? Hopefully, well, see, hopefully that'll be the rationale. But I don't know. You never know. No, it won't be. It won't be because they'll have to make an example to where they won't have to do that anymore. And so they're going to screw some kid's life totally up for going trick-or-treating. That's sad. Well, here's another angle. Depending on the community, if it's an affluent community, it, maybe it's a fundraiser and they're going to nail mom and dad in the wallet. Ooh. Oh. Got some roads to be built. Got some uh, maybe some sidewalks that need repaired. That could be the angle as well. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Could be. Could be. Yeah. See, I didn't think about it that way. They're gonna milk mom and dad for everything they have. Oh, they're yep, fine. That could be a that. possibility. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Knowing the absurdity of it, they're they're just shoving it through. It could be all about the infernal green dollar. Yeah, you trick or treat. Guess what? Come over here. I want some of that money. I want some of the money, little kids. I want some of that money from your mom and dad. Yeah, I like that. I like that. That's pro- I that's didn't think idea. about that, but you know, that's a pretty good. Yeah. Because the second one says they could be sent to jail for up to six months or and fined. 
Yeah. So maybe that's what it is. They'll probably be yeah. fine. They'll probably be uh, held in jail for a little while and then fine. Something like that. Either way, it's so it's bullshit. I say, if mom and dad just, will have to come pick them up. Oh fuck yeah, they'll have to. They'll have to. And of course, they'll have to pay for the costs. Of course. <laughs> It's just so dumb. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if they told me that mom and dad were coming to pick me up, I would just say, give me the death penalty right now. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> just so Put the needle in my arm. <laughs> it's just it's just a waste of taxpayer I'd, I'd, money. I'd send, the boys out. I'd send the boys out after having dined on 10 White Castles, baked beans, sauerkraut, and a 40-ounce glass of prune juice, <laughs> and then have it be in the cell. <laughs> have, have fun, Mr. Police Officer. <laughs> I love Patrick. <laughs> Be careful, though. They might make you pay for all that somehow. Yeah, they could, yeah. <laughs> we had to do some intensive cleaning in those cells, sir. We had to take some extra money. Have to... If you sneeze, you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Hey, you know, I don't know if you guys are in a- into anime, but holy hell. Have you heard about the Goblin Slayer? No, I haven't. Oh, man, this, this shit is, is crazy. Now, first of all, I have to say, as far as anime goes, I got out of it because, it like, it's always, like, too much exposition, just a bunch of silliness, you know, and, uh, long, drawn-out storylines and, and just explaining everything. Just show me, show me. This Goblin Slayer is just straight-up unmerciful ass-kicking. It's like the dread of the anime world. You know where dread, like, systematically kicks ass, lays waste to criminals, handing out sentences, like, Beads during Mardi Gras. This motherfucker, this Goblin Slayer, he just brutally slays these dirty ass, horrific little shits, and I mean horrific little shits. Becky, these things mm-hmm. are just the, these devious little motherfuckers. They'll do anything. They'll they'll kill and eat and devour and they'll rape. Oh my god! I know. What do they look this like guy, this guy's dedicated to killing them. Oh, yeah, he, he kills them all. And see, now, there's two major complaints that some people have, and I would like to say some busybodies who have nothing better to do. One complaint people have is that the story has involves rape. They see it as being needless, but my perspective is, if anything, it shows just how brutal these goblins are. And I understand people are probably hearing, what, what is it, anime? So it was like, is it glorifying it? Because you know how sometimes with pervy Japanese cartoons can get. No, nah, it, it shows a scene and it goes away real fast. And uh, for, the, for the watchers, this is what the scene looks like, just real fast. Boom. There you go. It's not going to get us kicked off. It's just, it's just like, this is what you see, those that are watching. And then uh, it just goes away. Hmm. Um, I mean, that's a controversial topic, of course, but a lot of movies have had that in there, and if there's retribution and justice, then, uh, I mean, that, that's that's more realistic. Yeah, that's my approach, right. too. I mean, like, uh, what's a horror movie? Well, I spit on your grave is one, but uh, Last House on the Left? Uh, like, yep. I mean, that, yeah. rape, that rape scene is one that I, I could not I could not sit through that. Like, it, it, it fucked me up mentally. Um, but... It so was, is um, the girl next door. Oh yeah. Oh shit. Fuck yeah, Jack Ketchum. Um, yep, that was tough. Yeah, it, but those that scenes. That was and and that's real. It is. Yeah, that was basically true story. It is. It I mean, is. So how do you all feel about uh, I guess story writers and creators that that include like sexual assault and sexual violence in, in their storytelling? Okay, so Nick Grabowski, my publisher, is going to be soon be, be releasing my second collection of short stories called Out of the Shadows, and the very first story called Over the Edge. It's a very brutal, brutal, uh, violent, gory story, and there is a little bit of that in there, but the, these bad boys that engage in that, hell is unleashed on them. I won't say anymore because it will be spoilers, but uh, their dirty deeds are taken care of. Let's put it that way. Okay. 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 Now, from uh, from the girl standpoint, you would like my opinion. Oh yes, yes. certainly. We would be a uh, bunch be a bunch of uh, you know misogynistic assholes if we didn't. <laughs> I, you know, I don't stand um, for that, Becky. I don't. No, I I know. Um, I don't think that there is anything wrong with 
it being in a book or a movie or whatever because it's real life it happens unfortunately um i think as long as it's handled appropriately um you know it is what it is if it's relevant to a story it's you know it should be in there yeah i mean that's fair enough i mean i can see that i don't i, I don't i don't think that you know I, I have read a book or two where you know it was too detailed too much um talk about it too much you know it, it wasn't necessarily what i would call glorifying it but there was just way too much detail too mm. much into that part of it that it, it you know it didn't need that but i think most of the time you know it's it's handled appropriately and i'm sure that you know patrick's is as well because he's a he's a good guy yeah i appreciate that i guys are vile disgusting prisoners that escape and get into a diner and they take advantage of a waitress mm. and, her, and then start on this frail man so i wanted to take my audience up to the peak of ultra revulsion and disgust with the, these particular four criminals and then once there was some empathy for this very frail guy that they were beating around and kicking um he suffers from panic attacks and anxiety but they're a trigger for lycanthropy so they have no idea what they're getting into. So you know what he turns into, and he just rips and every single human being in the entire diner to shreds. Oh, man. Yeah. So that that's so I, I just killed it with the spoilers there, but that's the opening story called Over the Edge in the soon-to-be-released collection, uh, Out of the Shadows. So there, there, there's an element of that. So, so the, the, the antagonists are ultra-repulsive, and there's some sympathy for the what you think is going to be a protagonist, but he ends up being even worse and more diabolical than the criminals, and he decimates them all. You know what? So it's a, kind of a no story. So oh, it, I, it will be controversial, uh, no doubt about uh, that. Okay, I have got to have this. So <laughs> you need to make sure that I know when it comes out, because I've loved your other three books, and... Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to have this. Yeah, I'm gonna need so a copy guys as well. Get, you guys, you'll get an advanced word doc in advance of it being published. How's that sound? Oh, that sounds great. That mm -hmm. sounds great. <laughs> because I tell you, that sounds kind of similar to this. This Goblin Slayer guy was the name of the character. He's brutal. He he kills them all. Like all the goblins, dead. Like there's a scene where like there's like little kid goblins. He's like, fuck that. You're dead too. <laughs> Everyone's dead. Every everyone that's a goblin associated with goblins, you're all dead. And that's the other complaint that they have, is that it promotes genocide because it's just eradicating goblins. I'm like, what? The, what the fuck? These busybodies on the internet. What do you think a zombie film promotes? Like, a zombie film is pretty much kill all zombies. Anything zombie is dead. Anything that's a zombie is a dead zombie. You know? What the fuck? It's it's just a monster. It's like, can't you? Can't people just have so fun people are anymore? protesting this. Yeah, or some yeah, busybodies. Yeah, they're picking on that. Well, every, every, every Sunday night on AMC, The Walking Dead. Yeah, I mean, how, yeah. zombies have rights too, bro. Who dies in that, right? Yeah, what? what, what why, yeah, why don't <laughs> zombies, just zombies have live? rights. Yeah, zombies have rights, bro. You didn't know that? <laughs> I mean, no, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> zombies, zombies were once people are you too, serious? man. Serious? Zombies were once people too. Come on, man. Think about it. They had rights before they died. Can I please smack people? Can I smack people, please? I wish you could. But you're going to want to smack people because With of this. With a chair. I, I, got, I got one more little news thing okay. that will make you rage. Did you see the uh, new Disney's okay. Aladdin? The uh, no. teaser the teaser for it? Yeah, people are kind of raging about that no. right now. The, the, they're raging about Why? it. Well, I'll check this out. So you think they have a diverse cast, right? I mean, they have a... They have a an actress who uh, is from India playing Princess Jasmine. You, you, you think that would be fine, I guess, right? But you'd be incorrect. Right? You'd be totally incorrect because, see, Princess Jasmine, as we all know, is is a real character, is a real life princess, a real life Arabic princess that needs to be portrayed none other by. 
an Arabic actress. There, there's no, there's just no other. You can't get around that. You know. Are you shitting me? No, I'm not. They they are outraged by that. Um, I mean, these busybodies, uh, Twitter types with nothing good to do. Uh, they're just going on about it about this. Did they hire the best actress? You would think that that should be all that matters. Right, especially for another one of these live action uh, adaptation. I'm glad I said it right that time. <laughs> adaptation of, of these uh, <laughs> these cartoon movies because it's like, when are they going to stop doing this? I, I guess it's popular. Did the Beauty and the Beast actually those do people well? At, those people in the theme parks that I mean that play the characters, they aren't. Middle oh. Eastern, and where in the hell did they find a beast to play the beast? That ain't real. Yeah. Well, they need to shut up. Good point. Good. You know what? Good point, Becky. I think, God, is, prevail. I think we're going over the top with the PC stuff. You think we're going over the top, it's, huh? You're right. You know what? You know what, Patrick? I think we haven't gone high enough. It's 2018. Let's go high. Let's see how far we can take PC. For now on, actors and actresses must be how they... You know what? Because after that, Tom Hanks, I don't think, was mentally disabled. We need to redo uh, Forrest Gump. We need to get a new... <laughs> oh, for God's sake. We need to redo that. Oh, uh, Jesse, what about Rain Man? Smack you. <laughs> what about Rain Man? Dustin Hoffman isn't really autistic. Let's get a real autistic guy in there. Okay? Huh? Come on, 2018. Let's let's be, let's not, let's not be exclusive. Let's be inclusive, guys. Yeah, it's get getting out of control at times. It seems like, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm going to be the first one that says this word on on the show tonight. Fuck that. This is that's just stupid. <laughs> Fuck that. That's right. It is pretty fucking yeah. stupid. I agree. I agree. <laughs> and I said it first. <laughs> That's did you? That just really irritates me. Oh man! But yeah, it's just busybodies. Yes, man. I did say it. Oh, and and one last thing here. Sorry. Uh, we have a poll on the Facebook group, uh, Facebook page, actually. Uh, Blade versus Lestat, and uh, the question is best vampire. And um. Oh, please tell me. Who do you think is winning? That Lestat one. Why? I would help look that. Why? You think Blade's better? Uh, best vampire? Why do you think? Yeah. I'll tell you why. Um. Because he's a badass. Blade could kick Lestat's ass any day, any time, hungover, with one arm behind his back. There's, there's I don't see any way. I don't. I don't can't. I, I, I really try to think about this, Becky. I can't see the scenario where Lestat wins, except for being, I don't know, a fancy, snobbish aristocrat. That's it. Like. Okay, now wait a minute. Maybe I misunderstood your question. Did yeah. you say who was a better vampire, or who would win in a fight between? Oh, I said who's a better vampire, and to me, that's, that's the same thing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> because how can you be a good vampire if you're going to get your ass kicked? More impactful and killing. Yep. Yeah. I'd, I'd go with Blade. Okay. Yeah. I, think, I think with Stat and, and all of the Anne Rice books, there's more a little bit more of an element of romanticism, not to the extent that it was with the whole glittery Twilight stuff, which I can't stand. No offense. Oh, God. Fire, all that, but I'm not a big fan. In fact, I wrote a, a short yeah, story on that in Blood Verse. But uh, I would go with Blade just because he's a martial art badass, and he would probably do more carnage and damage than Lestat could do. Oh, totally, totally. Man, I, I don't think there's any stopping him. There's no stopping him. And no. uh, right now in the no, poll... he got the vampire prowess, but he's got a katana, you know, the Japanese uh, samurai sword. He's got all kinds of throwing knives and weapons, and uh, he's yeah. just... Yeah, he's like a Navy SEAL vampire, basically. That's a martial art black belt. Yeah, that's true. And uh, there's some people on the on the, on the page who are like, wait a second. But Blade's only like half vampire. So you know how they voted. They're, they're probably in the same boat as you, Becky, which is okay. I, I get you. I get your argument. You're right. <laughs> the stat is actually technically more vampire. But my thing is, the half vampire that Blade is, 
like could totally stomp the shit out of Lestat. Like any time. Yeah, I'm with you on that one, Jesse. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but it's also kind of silly because it's like, uh, but wasn't the question better? And it's like, well, you know, strong strong is better, right? <laughs> like Khabib and Connor, right? Khabib is stronger. It's just all an in interpretation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get that. It's all like, you know, who's better, Jimi Hendrix or Jimmy Page or Eric Clapton? So some of it's stylistic preference at some point, too. Yeah. All right. Sure. Well, man, and, you know, since, I have, since we have you on here, Patrick, one thing I want to ask you, because you're a mixed martial arts guy, right? So I don't do mixed martial arts. I'm a fan of that. I've been classically trained in a Shaolin Kung Fu uh, system oh, wow. with my teacher, but we also adapted uh, Western street fighting with heavy kickboxing to it. So uh, at my height and my size, my prowess, I'm about 6'4", 230. Um, most of the people that I, when I spar, they're duck and bomb. So I, I don't like the little strong guys that come in and like to grapple. So that's what intrigues me about the MMA is the headlocks and some of the grappling uh, techniques that they employ. Yeah, that's kind of interesting because we, I'm not I'm not a huge follower of it. But I, I noticed that it's just every time, like MMA, like the... The, the, the jujitsu when they come in they grapple it's like it, it seems to throw everything else out the window right I mean like how do you compete with that yeah it's because there's so many different elements of martial arts that are weaved into it uh, short of uh, being in a back alley and, and damn near killing each other it's about the closest thing he can get to real fighting without uh, having people get serious serious injuries yeah so well and I guess, obviously Balls, you can't uh, blow somebody's knee out, you can't smash their throat, you can't uh, do cobra strikes to the temple, you can't poke eyeballs out. So there are some limitations as mm. opposed to what you would do on the street, but it's pretty pretty freaking real, so it's pretty hardcore. So wait, wait, wait. So if, uh, sorry, what was the discipline you were trained under? It's a Shaolin tiger style of Shaolin Kung Fu, so it was a five animal Okay. Uh, the tiger, the dragon, the cobra, the monkey, the crane, all of those different types of, of movements, and also many, many classical weapons. So single nunchuck, double nunchuck, sword, sickle, staff, oh, man. Uh, three-sectional staff. Uh, a lot of heavy bag work, a lot of sparring, and we did a lot of kickboxing uh, uh, as well. We had a lot of uh, old emergency runs back in the day until uh, liability lawsuits uh, uh, became germane because we had too many. Um, we used to go bare-knuckle fist to the face. We were pretty hardcore, Ooh, and... Uh, and we we're kind of have the reputation of being barbaric. It's not quite that insane now. I mean, maybe okay. Have... So in the in a, in a fight, um, I just want to make this very clear, Jesse, that Patrick is Team Becky. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I totally, I totally understand that. I, I, he would be Team. <laughs> Wait, are, are you saying on fight team between? Us. Okay, Team Team Becky, huh? No, no, Team Us. Team Us. Yeah, Team okay. Us, like me and you. Hmm. <laughs> Gotcha, gotcha. He's on our team. Okay, that's good. That's good. I like that. We gotta I'm have him. him. All right. So wait, I have to ask you though. So wait, if, if because the thing with MMA, because the grappling and it throws things off, uh, you know, uh, everything else, it, it kind of makes the, with the whole grappling factor, it makes all the other disciplines seem like what's the point of even practicing? But if you were to take all the rules out and be all, hey. You know, you could strike as hard as you want. You could use this style or you could use this technique within this discipline. Like, would it even out? Like, would the grapplers have a hard time? Well, the old cliche is kind of like what Bruce Lee used to teach with his Jeet Kune Do style. When, when the boxer comes at you, you kick him. When the, when the grappler comes at you, at you, you box him. Uh, when the kick comes at you, you grapple and throw him. So, so for whatever technique is presented, all three of those, if they're eclectic enough and you can weave them into your routine, you use whatever is necessary to prevail. Okay, okay. And uh, did you catch the uh, the Connor fight? I have not had a chance to watch that yet, other than just some of the sound bites and YouTube clips of that. Yeah. But it, uh, I, it's on my list of things to do. I uh, I've been a little preoccupied with some personal stuff the last couple of weeks, but I do want to catch up on that. Yeah, I just I just saw that. Uh, I mean, you know who won, right? Yep, absolutely. And how, how do you feel about well, that? Oh, well, it wasn't McGregor. It wasn't McGregor. It was not McGregor, yeah. 
Yeah, that... Did he crap? Yeah. Uh, Did he really? You know what? That trash talking motherfucker lost. And uh, yeah, he cried. He cried. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's uh, not nice. <laughs> but he got suspended, yeah, though. There was a big cluster after the fight, and people rushed the uh, rushed the ring, and it was just uh, just a mess. So it, it, the rematch will be interesting. It'll be all about big big bucks, I'm sure. Okay, so so you, so you know about the suspension then? Yes. Okay. Man, so why were they suspended? Do you know anything about that? Because I'm just like, what? what why, why would they be suspended? I thought it was a good fight. Like, I mean, <laughs> I think he took a swing at a civilian when all that broke out inside uh, the ring after the fight, and that that's a big no-no. So he he'll get fine and he's suspended, but then they'll come back and there'll be even more controversy and more more hype and more money. Hmm. I could be wrong, but that's what I heard. Yeah, yeah, that's that's played. That's played up. Oh, okay. Well, now that we bored everybody with uh, who's all into writing about MMA stuff. <laughs> all right, Patrick. <laughs> let's talk about let's put your writing. How long have you been writing, man? So I kind of started before the kids were born, uh, and then of course life takes over and you get distracted. And we've been living the last several years vicariously through you know baseball, football, basketball. Uh, Irish step dancing, martial arts, volleyball, softball, all that. And I lost my dad a few years back, and I thought, you know, he was a big fan, and he encouraged me to write. So I took it up in earnest and was able to hook up with Nick Roboski with Black Bed Sheet book, Books, and he gave me a shot uh, with my short story collection, Bloodverse, and then that was followed by a novel, The Night It Got Out, uh, and then The Maggots Underneath the Porch, and then I've got this next one coming out, and I'm currently working on a, a series of novels about a warrior that kind of like your goblin thing only he goes after demons from hell and oh, he's hired man. he's actually hired by the vatican and the vatican has this expert in demonology that's hooked up with him and then they go all around the world and one of these bad boys comes up from hell to try to stop them and kill them uh, also working on a mainstream uh, detective thriller and i'm also working on a martial art period piece about the greatest ninja medieval Japan, mm. who was separated from his family at birth and raised by a clan, and he's given an assignment to kill an eminent politician. And, and when he does his due diligence and research uh, about the politician, he finds out that it's his actual biological father, and his father's a good man. And so oh, he's wow. torn. Should he, should he honor the clan who raised him, or should he honor his father being a good man? And the story's called Honor Bound. So there's lots of flying heads decapitated with the samurai swords and a lot of flying shurikens and ninja stars, kind of crazy stuff. So we'll see how that one comes along. So that's a bit of a digression from horror, but obviously I have passion for martial arts too. Yeah, yeah, man, I'm interested in that too. Because, it, I mean, of course, you probably get a lot of flack from that by the same busybodies who give flack. We just mentioned the beginning of the show, but like, oh, what does he know about martial arts? Why is he writing about ninjas? Is he even Japanese? Blah blah. blah. You know, Becky, we're, we're, we, just, we did an episode not too long ago about how like uh, you can't people can't wear geisha costumes anymore because of right. this and that or the other. And the people who are saying you can't wear it, we're like, why are people saying it? I'm like, what, 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 what? what? Where's this coming from? So anyway, mm -hmm. what we're getting at, what it boils down to, is probably get some flack. But, I mean, you're prepared for that, though, right? Oh, yeah, they can bring it. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, because you, you've you trained in, in martial arts. Like, you know your stuff. You're not just bullshitting around, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert in kinjutsu, which is what the samurais did and the ninjas did with the katanas, but uh, still I know an awful lot about that, so I'm, I'm, I feel very... Very, very qualified, uh, I guess is the right word to write a story like that. Okay. And what sort of uh, re research did you have to do f for this book? Well, I'm right in the middle of it right now. So I, I, I read Miyamoto Musashi's The Book of Five Rings, which is a strategic book. And actually, the Harvard School of Business uses it because of the strategy, but he was the best samurai. Uh, in, in all of Japan for years, and his his five different move, movements that, that he concocted uh, with the the long sword uh, that the samurais used is the best fighting methods used by the samurai back in back in those days. And you know the real blade, if you were very very good, you could cut somebody in half 
from shoulder to hip with one blow, right through the bone. Okay. Nuh-uh. Yeah. Whoa, whoa. Really? Yes, really, for real. Now, the blade, oh the blades aren't made like the cheap things you get today. That was back in the day, so... You know, a lot of the stuff that you see in some of these ninja movies isn't all that far-fetched, even though some of it's a bit hokey. Uh, they were that good with the sword that they could cut through bone. Wow. Okay, so what, like, The Walking Dead, the katana, uh, shouldn't it have already broken by now? I mean, how much wear and tear can that katana take? I mean, how many times can it slice your bone without chipping and breaking yeah, that's a good point. Over After all these years, uh, it would need uh, some type of resharpening or some type of uh, remediation to it. And, and the way they're made today, they're cheap. So you could probably take the ones made today and break them over your knee like you would a, a twig or a tree branch that falls off your tree out back in, in your backyard. Mm. But back in the day, in the medieval oh, wow. times where they were handmade and they made them for six months, uh, they, they, those were the heavy-duty ones. If you wanted to buy one like that today, it'd probably cost you ten grand. Wow. Wow. Man, that's that's good to know. Good to know. So don't use a katana for zombie survival. Might want to just stick with a shotgun. I mean, that's going to do, right? That would do it. I, I would say a long pair of nunchucks with a long chain on it. That would do a lot of damage as well. Because uh, all you need to do is basically bash their skull. <laughs> so that would probably work pretty effectively, too. Yeah, I ended yeah. up bashing myself with it. <laughs> well, Becky. Well, I don't know, Becky. You know, like you keep on surprising, like like, like you, you 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 surprise punch people all the time. Patrick, did <laughs> Becky ever tell you the story where like this leather face guy with a chainsaw came after her and she just punched him around right the face? <laughs> God, that's like me. I watch I watch. Uh, n- n- no offense to the slasher movies, but when I watch Scream and I watch you know Halloween and I watch Freddy and and I watch. Uh, you know, Jason, I don't enjoy him because I sit there and I figure out how I'd kill him. Yeah. I know that sounds kind of crazy and insane, but that does not scare me. Oh, no. Yeah, I totally understand You're that. You're going to... The sad part about that is is that most of what he told you about that story was true. <laughs> it was a haunted house, and... um we were going through, and the guy jumped out in my face, and it was a reaction. I just I decked him. That's my kind of girl. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they invited me to leave. <laughs> uh, I bet they did. You kicked their ass, Becky. That's why. <laughs> Great. Well, that's I only... I mean, you know. And that's only one story. She has, many, she has many more. <laughs> you lie. Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know. So, I'm so mean. So out of all the stuff you could write, Patrick, <laughs> why why horror? Like, why, why gravitate towards horror? You know, a lot of people ask that. And I am trying to get a little bit more mainstream but when you when you think about horror then you know there is a certain connotation to it and i think a lot of people view it as just just gratuitous violence and gore for the sole purpose to repulse people or stimulate a visceral shock effect but i i think when you think about horror it transcends so many different genres think of alien and the sci-fi tie to that that was horrific oh, even yeah. the movie jaws the, the suspense with the shark so drama, thrillers, fantasy, irony, mystery, there's elements of horror in all of those. And, and I think mm. deep down in our psyche, it's probably the only genre that really gets deep into our brain and, and, and hits the core of that fight versus flight thing. So I'm being a little philosophical, a little preachy here, and I apologize. But I think that really, really stimulates a feral reaction in people. And they might want to say that they want to look away, but they want to know if the boogeyman's in the closet. They want to know if that uh, heavy breathing in the woods is, is the werewolf that's about to jump out and devour them. They want to know if that, that creak on the stair step at 3 a.m. Uh, is, that, is that stalker guy, that the slasher that's coming to you know, hack him to death, that type of thing. They can't help but look. So they're simultaneously intrigued and repulsed at the same time. And in my opinion, there is no other genre that does that. Yeah. Right. It's a good point. It's a good point. Like, they're going to have to look. They can't look away. It's kind of a, 
like a car rack car. Did I really kill that spider? Is it still under? Is it still under the book? Uh, um, exactly. The fear. Mm -hmm. Becky, did you kill that spider? Just no. I ran. Oh shit. Oh well, I had to tell you. <laughs> oh, it, but by the way, Becky, I thought about you the other night. I stepped on a spider. Oh my god. I guess it was pregnant. <gasps> it was pregnant, whatever. And all these like little bitty spiders Hush. came out. I'm just like, oh shit. Mm -mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, Are you serious? Where was it? It was outside in my backyard. <sighs> Good was, thing it was outside, not in your house. Yeah, I guess so. Patrick, Becky is like afraid of spiders, and I was like, man, oh, terrified. I'm in a teaser, and there's a spider story in Out of the Shadows that's nasty, and it's about a brown oh. recluse, Becky. Ooh. No, no, no. No, no. <laughs> yeah. no, no. And it's vicious, too. It is nasty. Oh, no. no, no you might no, want to no. skip that one. You, you, you might you want to really skip Yeah, I might. You don't really have to exaggerate. I mean, a brown recluse, I mean, their bites are already nasty. I mean, they're they're one of oh, the yeah. uh, mm -hmm. venomous spiders, right? They're like one of the two, or how many are there? They're venomous? Yeah, I, I think they more. and black widows. There might be a couple others uh, that can really do some significant damage. You're right. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I, I like that about horror, man. You, you, you like, you write something that they can't refuse to look away. They they want to know. You captivate them with the fear, like this is it, you know. Um. And and going into this genre, I mean, have you received any sort of like feedback or have you any sort of reaction, special from families or friends? Be like, man, why are you writing this? Oh my god, like it's so violent and. Yeah, uh, my wife Molly very much wants me to write historical fiction, you know, like uh, immigrants coming over from Ireland, you know, kind of like the Tom Cruise far and away type okay. uh, stuff, which you know, John Jake's uh, North and South Civil War era type stuff, which I'm sure I could do. It just doesn't turn me on right now. Uh, the mainstream detective thriller that I'm doing is a little bit more mainstream, but yeah, I write horror just because I envision you know busy business people sitting in an airport terminal and they just flight delay and, and they want to pour it into a book that doesn't have you know Tolstoy's worn pieces character development or scenery, but that it just grabs you by the throat and you can't wait to flip the pages and before you know it, it's done and, and you're on your plane. So that was kind of my angle with what I've written thus far, and as I'm growing as a writer, uh, hopefully I'll get more in depth with character development. Damn straight, man. Damn straight. I love it. I love it when books start off with, uh, or books, our stories, short stories, which starts off with an intense scene. Just like I want, I want the first two lines to really get me. If it starts off, I'm at the point town where if it starts off like uh, you're describing scenery or like a rising sun or moon, I'm just like, man, I'm like so close to turn this thing away. Get to it. Yeah, like, me too. Grab me. Come on. <laughs> I think the culture's changed, and, and if you guys are like me, my attention span is like a, a moth on a, on a, a light lamp at night, and if, if you're not hooked right away, you're inclined to put that book down. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. I think that says a lot. I think that actually relates to a lot of people, especially this day and age, you know? So one of the books I yeah. want to talk to you about is uh, Maggots Under the Porch. Mm, it's right. good. Now, uh, oh, thank you. Should should we be worried about flies? <laughs> so I was Maybe. watching. So here's how this one was birthed. I was watching on Animal Planet this thing about it was called myasis or mia myasis. I'm sure I'm mispronunciating it, but but it's it's a condition. You normally see it in third world countries where thin, things are underdeveloped often in cattle, but sometimes in humans, where aggressive African flies plant their larvae in humans and they grow inside of humans. Oh. And mm -hmm. coincidentally, that the same night as I was channel surfing, Stephen King's uh, uh, The Body, which was converted to the movie Stand By Me, was on. So I put the two together and said, okay, got to do it. Got to do a period piece, let's make it in the 70s, because I have so many older cousins that lived through that era that raved about when Jaws came out and the phenomenon of collecting beer cans and baseball cards and what it was like growing up a kid. 
in that era. So King did his piece in the 50s. I chose to do it in the 70s, and I did it against the backdrop of this horrific event that surrounded this nucleus of 13, 14-year-old boys in a small Indiana town, and it just happened to deal with this maggot scenario and a morbidly obese woman, and it just spirals in a negative way from there to a very horrific event. Wait a second. Are you telling me, and don't give it away, are you telling me the morbidly obese woman is the host for all these maggots and flies? Let's just say there's something very, very wrong with uh, the protagonist, Jimmy Turner's, Grandma, yes. Oh my God, mm-hmm. that makes sense though. There, there be so much to, there'd be so much room. I mean, not to make a fat <laughs> joke, but I mean, there's so much room, and you, they could, they could hide in the crevices and folds, and just, it's all sweaty and it's oh, all I'm hot gonna be and gross. humid. That's so sick. And it's, yeah, ugh. I think Becky's read it, so she knows that it can. It's pretty nasty. <laughs> It's pretty gory. It is. The biggest complaint, uh, the feedback that I've got the most on is people wish that it was longer. I probably could have developed it and made it a little bit more longer in its length and maybe developed the story a little bit longer. I, so I wrote it deliberately to be a novella, so it's barely 100 pages, so it's a very fast read. Again, I wanted somebody, you know, they want to curl up on a cold fall night by the fireplace and pour down a couple beers or a glass of wine or a couple shots of Jack or whatever turns yeah. them on and tear through a book in one night and be done. So this this would be it. Man, well, that's it. Yep. Now, I was reading the beginning of it. And it's, like, a, it's, a page, it's a page turner, too. I'm telling you. see that. You will not put it down. I don't care what, you, what anybody says. You start that book, you will finish it in one sitting. So, now, I understand what you got the idea from... Uh, from what the so this is a real condition like flies can actually lay eggs inside human beings. I mean, how often does it happen? I mean, it has it doesn't happen in the states though, right? I think it has in, in very very rural areas with very very poor individuals. It has also happened with people that have lost sensory touch. And I know I only know all this stuff from my research and and doing this. So people that are diabetics that have like bad. What's the term? I can't think of it. Um, neuropathy. Neuropathy. So they don't really have, yeah, it's peripheral neuropathy. Don't, they don't really feel things, and they've got some dead skin tissue on their feet. Oh. They're very prone to that. And, oh, so it, okay. it actually could happen. It, it's not likely to happen, but it could happen. So you know, I had an African fly oh. come over on a boat and breed with local flies, and that's the premise of the story. So having it happen here in the States is probably very unlikely. Guys, but if guys, you went guys, over hold on. Into- hold on, guys, guys, hold on. Hold on. It's 2018. We can't call them African flies anymore. Breeding with regular flies. That's just <laughs> No, that's just racist, guys. It's 2018. No, that's that's... No, because that's implying that that's somehow bad. That that's a fly. He's he's a he's a refugee fly. Okay, the refugee fly is <laughs> is mating with the other ones to. Uh, I don't know. I'm trying. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do it. I'm I'm really trying Jesse. to do it. What? I'm practicing. Jesse, uh, take a shot. Take a shot. <laughs> I already had one. I'm I'm trying you to practice. Need one. I want to write for uh, BuzzFeed or. Oh, I want to write for BuzzFeed. That's what I'm practicing. Or The Guardian. <laughs> or The Mary Sue. I want to write for The Mary Sue. Take, take a shot. You need it. <laughs> okay. No, there was a specific kind of fly. That I actually looked up what is the most aggressive uh, and carnivorous type of fly in the world, and it ha- so happened that it came from Africa, so that's where that premise came from. No, no, I get you there, dear. I get you there. It's just it was funny. I mean, some... some no, Overly PC you're... person can easily make that stupid joke, so I just made a forum, so I can just kill it. No, you're good. I knew where you're going with that one. <laughs> the, the, or the, uh, I remember I was a kid, but the Africanized bees. I was like, Africanized bees? Like, like, what's the big deal? Like, what's going on here? I was like, oh no, yeah. you gotta watch out for right. Africanized bee- bees. Okay. Anyway, here's the shot. Shot cam's on. Here's the shot. Hmm. What are we drinking? Jim Beam. Jim Oh, Beam. Lord. 
you remember it's Monday. And we have 41 subscribers now. We do. We do. Yeah, it's Monday. So, uh, nice. you know, that's two shots right there so far on the show. I took one earlier. If I, if, in order to take another one, I need I need five likes on this. Otherwise, I'm just going to just sober up, you know. Anyway. Oh, God. Please like the post. <laughs> You don't want you don't want sober, Mister <laughs> Dead Man. It, it gets it gets very serious very fast. That um, means forty one people are, are listening. I, that's that's awesome. Hello, all well, forty one. Forty one subscribers. Uh, they'll listen throughout. Well, I I don't know how many listeners are yeah. right now. It doesn't. It looks like one. It doesn't I, tell us that. Uh, let's fix that. Well, let's, I'm, that. I'm looking at the stream right now. Let's fix that. Um, okay, so. That's maggots under the porch. That one I definitely need to read. I was reading the beginning of that, um, and like I said, it, it just caught my eye. I was like, "This is just great," <sighs> you know. It's page. I want to talk real. about blood verse. Oh yeah. All right. Let's talk about blood verse. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, this is the first book of his that I read. Okay. And I was, I was hooked. It's a it's a really neat concept that he how he did this. Um, in fact, I'm people have probably done this before, but I had not seen it, and it worked so well with what he did. Okay. Um, it it was a short story. It's a collection of short stories, and then a dark poem that he wrote, and then oh. another. You know, it was, it was like you know, story, poem, story, poem, story, poem. I mean, and but they all kind of, you know, they all went together. And mm. it's just, it's really awesome, and I love it. And he is really a really good poet. He will argue with me and tell me he's not, but he is. I, I will well, argue. Coming from somebody who's that. As good as you are, Becky. Yeah, that's a great compliment. Thank you. Oh, psst. you're crazy. I don't know if you I'm write in. It. So much better than I do. I don't know if I'm in any position to judge anyone's poetry. I don't write poetry. Hell, if I were to write it, it would come off pretentious and kind of, you know, like Jesus, Mister Dead Man. Just don't worry about it. Come on, come on. It's okay. <laughs> no, I no. think you should try it. So, so blood verse is a collection of short stories, but with some poetry. Like, so a short story, poetry, short story, po- poetry. Say that real fast. <laughs> but uh, yep, that's exactly yeah. what it is. All right, story poem, story poem, story poem, all throughout the entire um, three hundred and sixty okay. plus uh, pages. So there's even a novella or two in there. So there's a couple really long stories. There's a couple really short stories, mm-hmm. and a couple long poems, a couple short poems. So it's kind of a, a nice compendium. Uh, of diverse tales. Okay. Right, now, th- and this- it, it really worked well together. All right. And this one I haven't read, but from the collection, like, what are, what, what is the story that stands out the most? Like, what is the one that, that you think about the most? I think the ones that I get the most feedback from are one is called Pain in the Boxer, and that's a little autobiographical, and I tore a tendon and my rotator cuff, and I couldn't work out for a while and had to do some physical therapy and all that. So I conjured up the story of a boxer who was on the ropes, no pun intended, with finances, and he was going to face the number one world contender. He was the current heavyweight champ, and things weren't working well. He had a daughter that had um, leukemia and needed a blood mm. transfusion, could afford it. Uh, soon-to-be mother-in-law that was all over him and didn't like him and didn't want his daughter to marry him, so the walls were kind of caving in on him. So he was popping Darvis sets while drinking whiskey one night, uh, you know, a few weeks before the fight, cursing at the pain in his shoulder, wondering whether or not, you know, just wishing that he could fight the pain because he solved all his problems all his life by fighting. Yeah. And lo and behold, this, this mist comes out of the hearth and this horrific demon from hell that causes all of the pain throughout the entire world takes him up on his offer and it's called pain in the boxer so that one i think is very original and i get a lot of kudos and feedback on that one Mm. um the other one that i I get a lot of it's pretty controversial it's called road rage bigot 
So <laughs> okay. kind of imagine. Think of Archie Bunker on steroids. <laughs> and I, I pulled no punches in disparaging every single gender, orientation, ethnicity, <laughs> just bashing them all. Mm-hmm. This guy is the most vile, okay. despicable human being you could ever imagine. And he's actually passing an Asian gentleman who is driving too slow as he's cursing him out and gets T-boned by a, a UPS. Or, it's either UPS or a FedEx truck and ends up going to hell. <laughs> and he's assigned the task of tormenting for 12 hours a day the very people that he hated on Earth because Lucifer was so impressed with him. <laughs> uh, there's a redemptive quality to it, and I'm not going to share that because it'll be a spoiler, but he has a change of heart and ends up doing the right thing and facing the ultimate price for that. I'll leave it at that. But that one's oh. very controversial because of the in-your-face um, racism and open oh. bigotry of this particular yeah. character. You got me. Now I'm... Uh, I, okay. I want to... I, I want to read that. I want to read him the. I want to read him the very first sentence in that story. Can I? Can I? Can I? Okay. Sure. Yeah. Wait. 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 Like, how crazy? It's do not you, nice. <laughs> how crazy do you get in this story? Are there like any uh, racial slurs? We're on YouTube. We can't. We can't oh see. my god. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Is this a racial slur, um, Becky? Do I need to like? Yeah. Oh, okay, well, let's, let's do it. Let's see if we can pull it on YouTube. You mean just you? You want me to? You want me to spell it instead of saying that part of it? No, just say it. We'll be fine. Just say it. <laughs> just say it. Just say it. Okay. The very first line is this: "You goddamn bug-eyed fucking gook! If you can't drive any faster than forty-five, then get off the road, you fucking slow-eyed bastard!" Screamed Barney Johnson, swerving his Ford F-150 around the petite Asian man's Toyota Camry, cutting him off and flinging him the bird. Mmm. <laughs> That's good. And that's your introduction to Barney, a despicable, vile human being who you will respect at the end of the story. Now, that, yep. that that's, that's a task right there. You turn a horrible human being into someone that can be uh, redeemed. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I have this thought too. Every now and then, when I hear people on Twitter, hear, you know, read people on Twitter flinging, oh, you're racist and this and that, I'm just like, hold on here, hold on. Like, I'll be like, oh, this person's horrible. He's a racist. As if it's the in all be all of horrible things. Like, well, yeah, sure, being, being a racist is not a, it's not an honorable trait, but it is very possible that that person may have some, like, let's say, bigoted views of other people. But he might donate to charity. He or she might give blood. There might be a kind person out there, uh, you know, when they're interacting on the daily. But maybe every now and then something slips. No, they're not. People aren't perfect. You know, we, we try to do, do our best. Some people do. I don't know. There's just, I'm going on a rant here. But uh, it's, it's interesting. What I'm getting at here is uh, I like the characters. I like complicated characters that can be redeemed. That's what I like. So uh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm definitely very interested in this one. Well, I took You'll it as like a challenge. Barney. Yeah, I, I took it as a challenge to write it about a despicable character that really doesn't harbor any semblance of my own views on the world, and it and change him throughout the course of the story so there's some redemptive quality to him, and that was a challenge. Mm-hmm. And my martial art teacher loves that one. He goes, "That's a freaking movie, so you ought to make that one." And into a movie, movie, especially in today's hypersensitive uh, culture, it maybe it would have a positive impact. Who knows? Because he, let's just say that he has a change of heart. Yeah. And locks horns with the ultimate evil over his change of heart. I don't know. I don't know. Would that do well this day and age? Or would uh, would certain groups kind yeah. of want him just to burn in hell forever just for being a racist? You know? I, I, I think they can suck it. I think people are smart enough that they would figure out the message and underlying meaning of it, mm-hmm. and that it's yeah, not the bigot; that it's actually exposing the bigot, the bigot for his his frailties, his weaknesses, and his fears, and the fact that he wakes up, and where he wakes up, and what he's facing when he wakes up yeah. is powerful in my opinion. Now I'm biased because I wrote it, but um, I don't know. What do you think, Becky? I think I think it would resonate with most people. I think I do too. I really do. And I agree. I think it would resonate with most people. It's just, I'm trying to think of 
compli- recent movies had complicated characters that had like like especially if they're like racist and they like changed. I mean recent recent like within the past uh, three years, four years. Um I don't know. It's there just, are. I just can't think of them. I yeah. mean, I remember seeing some. The only thing that comes, yeah, nothing really comes to mind. I'm just thinking stupid, uh, you know, like superhero movies, and, and those aren't those aren't anything, you know. Oh man. Right. I think this would be a really good, really really good movie. I think it would be just. I would that, watch just it. That line, it would be hilarious. Uh. It, if if I was in charge, I'd probably make it like into a dark comedy. <laughs> if, if I could resurrect Chris Farley and have oh, him, I don't know if you would after you after you read it. I think you oh. would change your mind about that. <sighs> okay. It can't it can't be a comedy. Uh, yeah, he, uh, he, he he goes to hell, and he you know he's assigned an escort, and it's the Marquis de Sade who's his mentor. Uh, Joseph Mengele from Auschwitz has a private crush on him. Oh, oh so that's shit. Yeah, and yeah, Barney, yeah. Barney's not, completely, okay. Barney's completely repulsed by that, of course. And um, Lucifer's mm-hmm. like uh, John Forsythe from the old uh, '80s uh, uh, uh-huh. Dynasty TV show. You know, five thousand dollar Armani suit and all of these rich amenities that he owns. So it, it's it's very very in depth. So I kind of combined Dante's Inferno and um, I'm trying to think of the other person that wrote about hell. Who else besides Dante and his Inferno, Milton, Milton's uh, Paradise yeah. Lost. So I kind of wanted to do that, but take an Archie Bunker-like character who is disgusting and become sympathetic to the audience. Okay, and I'm hoping, and it works so well. I'm I'm still trying to see how an Archie Bunker in Hell wouldn't be funny. <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess it's kind of like like what he does. In you hell. just have to read okay. this. You have okay. to read this. Yeah. Now, I have I have a pretty. And the other one I think is though. controversial is I, I I did one called the Veteran of the Craft. So everybody loves vampires, and this one really has not gotten the attention that I would have hoped that it would have got. I kind of did it intentionally to kind of thumb my nose at the all the the glittery stuff, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So nobody mm-hmm. ever. Nobody ever traced the origin of vampirism. And there were two main demons in Mesopotamia. One was Pazuzu from The Exorcist. The other was this she-wolf thing, and I can't pronounce it. I'm probably crucifying the name, but I think it was something like Lama Shutu. So this, I traced the origin of vampirism to this particular demon. And Is this I have real? the oldest position. No, this, no that, it's total fabrication fiction, but nobody had ever done that. I guess Stoker was probably the only one that came close to it when he wrote Dracula way back when, you know, tracing it to Vlad the Impaler. Oh. But, uh, so this goes back to Mesopotamian times, and this is the oldest, longest surviving, most vicious vampire on the face of the earth, and now he's a billionaire. And he actually owns a production company that is producing a vampire show that he views as a personal affront to him. So he has his lack to kidnap the leads, and of course you know what he probably does to them. He has about a $500 um, basement that's a wine cellar. Of course, it's not filled with wine. They're just, that's just his reserve. Every one of them is filled with blood yeah. from, you know, five centuries of him being alive on Earth. So he, he wreaks all kinds of carnage and, and, and havoc uh, all over the place. Owns an NFL team, so this, this guy's got tons and tons of money over the centuries, but it was a direct, to me, it was, it was a frontal assault on the, what I call the sissified way we're doing vampires now. Yeah. I mean, I would have, man, because they're, they're so watered down. It's like, what are you doing? I mean, this this yeah. glittery crap, and they're all, like, emotional and uh, teenage and dramas and, like, and they're just, like, in high school bullshit. It's like. What are you talking about? Even even Lestat is better than that, you know. I'll take Lestat yeah. over any glittering motherfucker any day. Um, yeah, there's no <laughs> romance with this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No. I mean, no. Granted, if I was a vampire, I lived for like I lived for like centuries upon centuries. I probably would have any romance in my in my body 
either. Everything is like dead to me, you know? And I think that I think that was a core message of Dracula though. I think he turned into he turned into more of a like he he felt I don't know if you want to say remorse, but it was like he realized that he's the monster. You know, like he he's never gonna find love. He's never he's never gonna be able to, to have love. Because he's he's Dracula. Everything he touches dies. You know, does it make sense? I mean, I'm just it saying that if I was a vampire, sense. I'd probably be a cold, a cold hearted motherfucker. That's what I'm saying. Is uh, because you will the, like this guy then. You'll like you'll like this character then. Well, I mean, does he do any heinous things? I need to be worried about because I was kind of liking the argue. I was kind of liking the what the Bernie guy. What's his name? What was oh, that? Barney Johnson. Barney. Yeah. Barney. I was kind of liking Barney. him. I was finding him funny. I was finding him hilarious. But uh, you won't find him hilarious. funny when you read about him. All right, all right. I'll hold you yeah. to it. You'll okay. hate his ass. I'm telling you. Oh. Yeah, he's despicable. He's despicable. <sighs> I did. I wanted to smash him. Ooh, I didn't like him at all. Then I felt sorry for him. Did he like keep? Yeah. Did he- did he kick like a little old lady or something? Was he like, or did he? Did he? He's just a dick. He's just a dick. Oh, mm. Okay. He was a ginormous dick. Yeah. Yep. See, that's the thing. Foul mouth and everything and everybody who wasn't exactly like him. He didn't like his lot in life, so he lashed out at everything and everybody. Didn't treat his wife very nice. So just an overall mm-hmm. jerk. Or- like a total mm. dick, as Becky said. Yep. So uh, if, dick. <laughs> if they were to turn that into a movie, uh, who would be the best actor for that? You have an idea? Wow, that's a great question. I haven't even thought of that. I was thinking like Billy Bob, Billy Bob Thornton. You know, he could play a good asshole, but if he did it, it would be uh, like it'd still be comedic. I don't know, I'm still on that. He'd give up. Oh, and be drama. Um, what's the guy that? What's the guy's name? Dwight Yoakam. Uh, what was he in? He would be good. He was in Sling Blade. He was the oh. dick in Sling Blade. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Huh. Do you know who might be able to pull him be- off? Cause he, was, he, was, he was funny as hell in True Lies, and he might be able to pull it off, and, and he might even get, get into your comedic angle of things, Tom Arnold. Oh, Tom Arnold. Okay, I was gonna go with Arnold. Oh yeah. Yeah, Tom Arnold is an asshole. He can do it. He can do it. Yeah. He's a total. He asshole. could probably. John Goodman could too. Because he's a oh. funny, likable kind of guy. So he might get. He might be able to get away with being an obnoxious bigot. <sighs> but John. Okay, Tom Arnold might be eager for it because he's hungry. He's thirsty for roles because you know he needs he needs money. Uh, but John Goodman might be the better pick. John Goodman would be good at this one too. Absolutely. I can really see him doing that too. Now we just have to wait until the Connors fell because I don't know how they're supposed to do Roseanne without Roseanne. So <laughs> because after that, uh, John Goodman might. Well, be... it's not Roseanne's anymore. No, it's not. It's not. Um, how did they get rid of her anyway? I don't know. I, I mean, they killed... I mean, I know what she did, but I mean, they write her off or what? I think they killed her off on the show. <laughs> she talked about on the. Uh, I yeah, wonder. She, she talked about it on the Joe Rogan podcast, and uh, it's just it's just like man, she was going to detail. She's like, yeah, you know, I, I started that show from the beginning. I wrote it up and all this stuff. But if I were to just cancel it and all those people lose jobs, so I'm not gonna do that. So I signed off on it. I signed off that yeah, they can they can go without me. It's like all right, well, at least, at least she honors that. You know, she she does care about yeah people's work i mean that's important too <sighs> i'll give her that anyway yeah so what other what other short stories in this collection should we, I mean, this is gold right here i love talking about short stories i mean i can i can banter on these for for, for hours um what, what's another really good one i'll defer to becky which ones did you like uh, the best oh what? oh man go ahead what I was going to say the dark poetry. What were you going to say? The poetry. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. That would be a perfect time. Read the poetry. Yes. I think one of my favorites was um, probably 
pair. Okay. That one, I don't that know one why I like that one. You so, like hair? What were you so, <laughs> circa, circa 67, hate Ashbury, and this guy was looking for the ultimate high. And he got right. a drug from a drug pusher that was not FDA approved, and it was designed and created to enhance the wool industry. And he woke up the next morning, and he had a full beard and hair halfway down his back. And it started growing on the inside and the outside of his body, and it goes from there. And the story back forwards to contemporary New York City, and it's even escalated and come back in a more vicious way. But it's kind of a period piece about the psychedelic era of the 19... Yeah, 1967, when Jim Morrison was out there with the Doors and Janis Joplin and um, you know, Jefferson Airplane and all that stuff and uh, and all the psychedelic drugs that were going on, and he was looking for the ultimate high and, and of course, paid the ultimate price. It's really good. Oh, man. Did we lose Jesse? No, I'm here. Oh. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the cycle. I'm thinking about the uh, trying to achieve the ultimate high. What would that be like, man? I don't know, but you you don't want to take an experimental drug. So, so not <laughs> he took a drug where the hair just grows and grows, and grows inside and out. So where the hair is growing inside his body too. Tongue hair, in the lungs, oh. ear hair. Mm-hmm. Oh. Hair, oh. breathing becomes an issue at a point in time, and I, I get graphically descriptive oh. uh, with all of that mm-hmm. and what, what the guy goes through. Yes. Oh, man. Yeah. And I think that's what I really liked about it was, I mean, I was like, oh, my God, no. <laughs> yes. And, yeah. Everybody knows what's coming, so there's no real surprise, but... You want to know how it happens, so to speak. Right. And and yet, even though you know it's coming, you just don't know. You know? I mean, when you read it, you're like, oh! <laughs> and that's a good delivery. I mean, and also, oh, you know, it kind of reminds me of, uh, what was it, uh, Creep Show. With, uh, the guy with the meteor and the, uh, he, uh, shit, what was it? What was the story called? What was it? Uh... I don't know. I, I can't remember the reference or what it was called. But uh, that weird fungus, the weird green stuff that's <laughs> grown over them and, and inside and out or whatever. It oh, turns, yeah. Stephen King yeah, played Stephen that King when the meteor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The meteorite. Yeah, yeah. 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 This, is, this is really good. I mean, he's got good, good stories in here. I mean, he can write. Man, I mean, now, that, that would that would stop people point. from taking drug, uh, drugs, though. If people start lacing it with like some <laughs> sort of chemical that causes you to grow hair, no, it inside wouldn't. Your lungs. They, ta- they lace shit with rat poison and everything else now, and they still take it. Yeah, um, it's great. Well, yeah, maybe you have a point. I, w- I would hope that they would stop if they're growing hair inside their lungs, you know, coughing up a hairball like a cat. Oh, once it's dark, there's no stopping it. <laughs> Yeah, he he walked into it unwittingly and unknowingly. He did not deliberately. He did not know what he was taking. Let's put it that way. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, you feel is, sorry for him, but you kind of don't feel sorry for him. So there's there's some mixed there's some mixed emotions there. He did it to himself, uh, but yet at the same time you feel some sympathy for what he's going through. Okay. Mm-hmm. So uh, what sort of experimentation have you done in? Uh, you know. Well, being Irish Catholic, are you probably. Him? Are you asking me or asking in the in the books? Oh no, I'm asking you know f- for research purposes for the books. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's on research. No, 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 my discipline of martial arts doesn't do that. But being Irish Irish Catholic on St. Patrick's Day, uh, you could probably just forego the glasses and just do an IV to the Guinness keg with me. So, <laughs> you know, for that, I'll take another shot from the shot cam. Look at that. Yeah, there you go. Yay! Shot yeah. cam on. Shot there cam. Yeah. Jim Beam. So as I get older and I, I keep thinking I should 
just give up alcohol together because it, it, that does nothing but add empty weight that I used to be able to burn off when I was much younger. So yeah, I noticed my gut's been getting bigger. God damn it! Yeah, it's inevitable, <laughs> it's inevitable and it's very hard to keep the gut off. <laughs> All right. I got hay bales y'all can throw. Oh, fuck that. I don't want to do any labor. <laughs> hey, uh, so, yeah, give us another one of the of the poems. I want some, I want some more dark dark poetry. Yes, yes, yes. So you, did you want me to go ahead and read one then? or? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, please. Go and read one. Okay. Okay, so this one's called The Guillotine, and I was watching... Several years back, I was watching uh, Braveheart, and uh, the end scene where, of course, Mo Gibson gets his head chopped off, and I just thought, okay, what could I write about something like that? So even there wasn't there was not a guillotine in it, I came up with the following. So, the man looked at the platform outside the cramped cell, viewing a heavy blade forged in the fires of hell. Killing steel has been used many a time for theft, poaching, or even a lesser crime. The blade crashed down and blood sprouted around, leaving a severed head trying to utter sound. Nerves still working in the torso below, signaling the mouth to form a horrified O. Over the years, heads have rolled and blood has flowed, as the law of the land has a morbid, bitter code. Tomorrow at dawn has been marked as his day. Neither family pleas nor foul weather will cause a delay. A shudder of fear travels up his spine. Death is beckoning. You are mine. A crowd will gather at a quarter till four, human vultures numbered a hundred or more. By some miracle will God save his life, if not, who will care for his kids and his wife? They hungered, and it was just a small fruit, not any bigger than the heel of a boot. For now they want his head, eighteen more hours of gnawing dread. He begins an agonizing vigil for a date with doom, knowing a day from now home will be a tomb. Oh, that's some powerful Mm. stuff. Uh, line by line, oh, man, yeah. where do I go? Uh, well, I think you did a it's really good. Great, yeah, you did a great job, really, uh, capturing the scene of an execution. I could see it. Poems are poems are harder because you not only have to try to get the syntax, so the rhyming, whether you do every line or every other line, but you also need to weave elements of t- telling a story into the poem. So I think sometimes poems are way harder than writing an actual story. Yeah, I can agree there. I can agree with that. But you, know, you also had me thinking, too, about the executions. I was just like, um, I know I could, I could visualize like the head just being lopped off and the, you know the head still being animated because the brain's still sending signals from the mouth and the eyes. It's still like it's still twitching, you know, as much as it can. It just just a mental image of a, a head rolling with its eyes blinking and mouth moving. Just that must be a trippy sight. Can you, yeah. Can you yeah. Imagine so there that? was some shock effect. In- intentionality there to give a little bit of a, a gore picture there and, and I think that that was one line that stuck with with readers it stuck with me when I you know when I pulled it out of my you know what and I thought oh hey let's do it I like that so mm. sometimes you write stuff and you surprise yourself <laughs> man what about you Becky like uh like what do you think about it I love I love his his poetry because um, it flows well. Um, it's easy to read. It's but the story that it tells and how you can see what's what he's talking about in it, and it, it just all works so perfectly together. Mm, yeah, yeah, I can see that too. And I also like the the line about the humanity being the vultures. You know, just kind of watching watching this guy be executed for some crime he committed probably theft or something else mm-hmm. you know yeah he's a dirtbag but now he's gonna die and, and the crowds just cheer it on when they could be next they could I don't know steal a loaf of bread <laughs> one day and then right be next exactly 
So I was thinking of Braveheart where they were wheeling him in on that thing uh, where it was all tied up around the neck. If you guys have seen the movie, and then oh the yeah, great movie. Up, yeah. great movie, great movie. At him and then yelling at him and cheering and, and all that stuff. So that's kind of where I was going with that. Yeah. Hell, Mel Gibson's trying to come back. I think he has a chance. Give him a give him a role in your uh, your Hell movie. He could play. Um, I don't know about Satan. I don't think you play good Satan, but uh, he could definitely be. He, he could be a good asshole too. We can make him the. He, we can make him the guy that um, has the the man crush. Oh, <laughs> on Barney. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he could do that. He'd be a good marquee. He'd be a good marquee de Sade in that story, probably. Who's who's? Yeah, Marty de Sade. What? What? That's so funny. Now I gotta read this story. Now, see, <laughs> now I really gotta read you, this story. You do. Yeah, it's you it's brutal. It's really brutal. Do. And I, I again, I don't pull any punches, but he ends up going where he deserves to go because of being the bigot that he is. But then, mm-hmm. when he, when he, I don't I don't I don't want to belabor the whole story and and, and over talk it and over hype it, but. The, the redemptive quality is what I want people to remember. Not the bigotry, but the redemptive quality of right. him realizing the errors of his ways. And that's what people like. Most people, most people anyway, they, they love, they like stories like that where there's a character redeems themselves. That's, hey, I mean, of course, I'm going to Darth Vader right now. <laughs> Star Wars, sorry, Star Wars, the, uh, the original <laughs> trilogy was... It meant a lot to me as a kid, and when when Darth Vader mm-hmm. finally like realized the error of his ways, and or you know just he, he he realized he totally fucked up. It was too late though. It was too late. It, it was he fucked up too too hard for too long, and he he stepped into the Emperor down and all that stuff. Just oh yeah, when it he was picked good. the Emperor up and got electrocuted. That was powerful. Yeah. Ah oh, man. Just moments like that. People like that. They want to see a bad character do good. I think at heart, people are willing to forgive. And even a, a, an abominable, despicable human being like this, it, they you're repulsed by him and you want him to suffer. But as the story continues to go on, I think you slowly start rooting for him. Yeah. And that was really hard mm-hmm. to do hard to write, but I'm, I'm hoping that that's what was achieved in this particular story. It was. Well, I'm definitely going to read that one, and I will let you let you know how, if I like enough, I'll leave a re- re- review. I would I love it. You'll That'd like it. Great. Yep, and be brutally honest, because that helps me um, become a better writer, because school's never out in this industry, and I'm always trying to better hone the craft and write better prose, and uh, I welcome constructive criticism and feedback. Oh, and that's another part uh, of this. So, uh, the books you have out right now are are they published through a, tr- a traditional publisher? They are. It's a small press publisher called Black Bed Sheet Books, and the proprietor is Nicholas Grabowski. He actually wrote uh, the novel that, the, that accompanied the screenplay for Holly or for, for Halloween Four. And Nick's been mm-hmm. in, around for quite some time, and has got about a hundred authors under his belt. Uh, through Black Bed Sheet Books. So I, Nick has been very good to me. In 2013, he had about 1,200 submissions, and I was blessed to be one of 10 uh, that he picked. So I I, uh, I, I had, did not have to go the self-publishing route. And I have nothing against anyone that does self-publishing, but I've been very, very fortunate to have been uh, with a traditional publishing company. Gotcha, gotcha. He's and, a really nice guy. And with... With the uh, with the small press, I mean, you you get the advantage. I mean, you do get some perks, though, right? I mean, they help you out with the marketing. Yeah, he does to a certain extent. Uh, he's not a power. I mean, he's not like one of the big five. Uh, uh, you know, like Simon and Schuster. Obviously, from a budget standpoint, it would be great for us to put you know an ad on the back of USA Today or the New York Times for fifty grand. But that's out of the question. So we we heavily utilize social media. He does. I do. Um, most of the authors do so. We're, we're all all over Twitter, all over Facebook, all over Goodreads, uh, as much as we can. And then we, you know, actively reach out to professional reviewers and ask them to say, "Hey, give me your brutal, candid feedback. Here's a complimentary copy. You're not going to hurt my feelings. It's just going to make me a better writer." And they do, which is great. Hmm. 
Okay. I mean, and that's what's important about about reviews. It's good to get that feedback because that's how that's how writers grow. Uh, when you just get the, exactly. like a hug box, no one no one does well in a hug box. <laughs> that's right. And you got to be thick skinned and throw your ego out because everybody has blind sides and and people. I mean, you're going to know when, it, when there's something that's constructive that's of value. It's like, oh my gosh, I didn't see that. That's a great point. Versus what I call right. some of the trolls. Okay that are people that didn't maybe make it and they might be a little jealous and they just say, this is the worst piece of shit I've ever read in my life. Don't read this, but there's no reason why. And you know, they're just saying it to give you a one star, that type of thing. And I just, I just throw that out. But if they give me one star and they say, I didn't like this, I didn't like this, I didn't like this, I didn't like that. I didn't know way you did this. The ending stunk and here's why I will read that. And I will yeah. take that to heart and I will, I will, I will use that then. Okay. And then that's good. I mean, that's how you grow as a writer. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, and then there's some writers that yeah. I know, I'm not going to say any names or anything like that, but it's like they get one thing published, <laughs> and the next thing you know, they're like offering writing advice to other writers. Like, uh, you got like one short story. or yeah, I, It's not like a pissing match. Yeah, you're published, but it's just, um, I don't know. You could just say yeah. you know the market and know this and that and the other but okay maybe you need to humble yourself a little bit yeah I was going to well, say I, in this industry God there's so many awesome writers out there you've got to be humble absolutely yeah I mean it means a lot I and agree I, I think I think that goes further than uh, you know boasting oh yeah this is how you're supposed to do it this is how you're supposed to do it because because the people that then telling people how special you are yeah, right. Uh, you attract people, and then those people right. far follow your uh, examples. And if it fails, then they're just going to eat you alive too. Because, well, they right. followed you because they're hungry. Yeah, and I, I get agree. it. It's it's a very competitive market, and uh, you know, not no. Even with Dead Man's Tome, not everything sells. Some some anthologies do well, some don't. I mean, oh, they're you're all breaking up just a is that my end or your end? Yeah. You're breaking up just No, uh, that's, that's him. No, well, oh, uh, your head's still. <laughs> my head is still. My head is still. It's coming through on the on the show. Am I might come in. Can you guys hear me now? I can hear you yep. now. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. I was saying. Don't move. <laughs> yeah, I, I was saying that. Um, I don't know. That it kind of the the Skype problem kind of uh. Rubbing it the wrong way, but it was I was getting as I I get that the the um, market's very competitive. It's a very competitive market, and it's just it's hard. It's hard to make money doing it. You know, it's hard it, to make it is. Living. I probably got into it at the wrong time because nobody really wants to read the the print media now. Everybody wants to read air on their Kindle, and also. If you got a couple of grand, you can go to these self-publishing places, and and you know, our dogs in the house could write a, write something and get it published. And I'm not disparaging again self-published authors because there's very there's a lot of really really good ones out there. There's also a lot of really really bad ones out there. Then you get in this mm-hmm. big miasma that we know is Amazon.com, and you're competing for shelf space, pun intended, and you get caught up in that whirlpool, and nobody <laughs> even knows you're even out there. Yeah, right. that's true. When when everyone has the means to uh, publish, that's what you get. Um, there's people that literally take their blog posts and put them in in a in a book and put it up there. Um, yeah, and they expect people to read it, and they wonder why no one reads it. Somebody wanted me to take all of my author interviews and put them in a book and publish it, and I was like, um, yeah, no. Well, that might be of interest. That actually might be interesting. Though. That might be interesting, though, Becky. That you could that might go because people might want to read that, especially if they're fans of certain authors. That kind of thing. You never know. Maybe. Now we are coming towards the end here. Uh, one last question I have for you: What is your favorite horror film? Yeah. You know, probably the one that. You're going to laugh at the first one, but the one that really scared the crap out of me because I was little. Um, 
and I, I didn't see it when it first came out. It was the second release, probably was the original Jaws. I just as a little kid, I had nightmares of the shark coming up the bed like I was Quint about to be eaten. Um, so that that oh. triggered me. Otherwise, some of my older cousins that were so intrigued by it that culminated in you know the maggots underneath the porch. But I still think mm-hmm. probably the most horrifying horror movie is, is The Exorcist. And I know it's cliche, mm-hmm. and I know a lot of people don't like it, but yeah, if you really understand the underlying theme of that, that the, the demon Pazuzu was not after the little girl, it was after the priest, because he was having doubts with his faith. He was hearing confession from other priests who were doubting their faith. It was the height and peak of the sexual revolution. It was the peak of the Vietnam War and all this controversy, and the demon knew if it got a priest soul, it would be a huge coup. And that was the underlying theme of the movie, and it was very powerful, not to mention the horrific uh, special effects in that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, th- th- that's a movie that a lot of people pick. A lot of people on this podcast, they pick Exorcist. Uh, I haven't Yep. I haven't run a tally of how many times people pick that one, but I'm sure it's pretty high. A lot. You're right. We should. Yeah, I like I like saving this question to the end because it kind of kind of builds perspective a little bit. It's like oh, okay, well, in, in in Jaws, man, I I can't I can't swim in the ocean at all because of, of, of Jaws. I just just the idea that a shark could be near me at any time. And they are. Yeah. Fuck that. Oh. So if I ever get published as a big writer, I'll, I'll take you guys. We'll go to a uh, Great Barrier Reef on Australia. We'll charter a boat. We'll get old Rodney Fox to go out there who survived an attack. We'll go down to the cages, and we'll interact with them and film them and, and do selfies with great whites. How's that sound? Am I allowed to bring a flask? Yes, and I want to. Can I? Is there plenty of beer on the boat? Oh, well, if permissible by the Australian authorities, we would uh, have uh, your favorite brew, yes. Okay, cool. All right, we I want it. I want to go. Really, I seriously do. I love it. I think it's yeah. so cool. I want to be in a shark. I want to be in a shark cage. No, no, with sharks yeah, inside the cage. But with sharks outside of the cage. Okay. Uh, that's not my, that's just my, don't my, sing the damn song. Baby shark. You no, don't sing no, baby shark. Yeah. No. Someday on my bucket list, we'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I would just love it. Man, I don't know why I like them. I think they're incredible. I can't believe you like sharks. You like sharks over spiders? Hell yeah! Uh, I think I'd rather have a spider next to me than a shark. No. Absolutely not. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I'd you'd, you'd pick a spider? I, I could kill a spider. I'm not sure I could kill a shark. Yeah, see? See, see that, Becky? You hear that? Yeah. How are you going to kill a shark, Becky? You going to punch it? No. I mean, you can't step on why a am I going to kill it? Because it's going to try to kill you. No, you? if I go, if I go to, it would be quick. You going to hug it? Um, you hug the shark? If I, maybe. Be friends with it? Look here now. I'm gonna hurt you. Look, if if I go to step on a spider, it's gonna jump, and I'm gonna get too close to it. It's gonna land on me. It'll run up my leg. I'll pass out, fall over on the floor, and it'll run up my arm. And when I wake up, it'll be sitting on my forehead, and I'll have a massive heart attack and die. Man, you really thought this through. It's a lot more. Yes. It's but you're mis- a lot you're- more deadly than a shark. I think it would lay eggs inside of you, too. Shut up. It'd be like maggots under the porch, but with spiders. <laughs> spiders and baby uh. spiders. Oh, God, Jesse, I don't like you anymore. Baby spiders, man. Spiders <laughs> and baby spiders. What's You know what's cool about you stepping? Just like- okay, when you step on a, on a mama spider and she's all pregnant... Like mm. you don't really realize, but all those little bitty spiders—they're already alive. They just they skittle, scattle <laughs> outside. They, they they like scatter. Wow. They're like moving around for the grass or somewhere else. It's weird. 
It's like, what were they doing in there the whole time? Just getting stronger? Just, just waiting for the time? Huh. They're probably like, eating their mother. Probably. I hate to tell you, Becky, when Nick, release, when Nick releases out of the shadows, there's a shark story and there's a nasty spider story, the brown recluse one that are in out of the shadows. So. Oh, man. A spider story and a shark story? I like the shark, shark story? stories, though. I like shark stories. Did you write this book for me or what? <laughs> Did you write this book for the show? Because we made this joke before. Are we talking about a shark spider? What's going on with this? No. No, a spider no we're not shark? talking about shark spiders. Two separate stories. Some sort of like sci fi abomination? Is that going to be like their next thing? Yeah, you could do a shark with a spider and then have it fly in a tornado, and it could be uh, Spider Sharknado. Yeah, Spider Sharknado. There you go. It shoots webs, too. So it could be like a superhero, a superhero uh, Sharknado. God, can you imagine? I, I, I can't imagine. And sci-fi can probably imagine. Oh, yeah. And Tom, Tom Arnold, Tom Arnold will, will play a role. He's desperate. He'll play a role. He'll be in it. Oh, man. Well, Patrick, James Ryan. It was great having you on the show, man. Listeners, if you made it this far, yes. press that thumbs up button and share around. Sharing is caring. If you don't share, then you don't care. Come on now. Press that thumbs up button. It helps out. Uh, share to someone who likes horror, who likes to you know, just be entertained. That's what the show is about, okay? Um, I know I joke a lot, make a lot of comments and jest, but you get it. It's, f it's for fun. Patrick, what do you think? You come back on sometime? Absolutely. You guys have been awesome. It's been a real honor to be on the show. I enjoyed very much talking to you guys, and you guys are a hell of a lot of fun. All right, man. It was great having <laughs> Yay! you. It was great having you on. Absolutely. All right, Patrick. Yeah, you take it easy. Thank you so much. Best, best wishes with your blog and your and your YouTube, and I will I will make a point of watching these. I like it. All right. Thank you. All right. With that Thank said, you guys, take care.